brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, host of The Weekly Worldview, amateur comedian, Bible student, science geek. We're going to talk about psychoanalysis, ADHD, drugs, and damnation was the title of the show. Not to put too fine a point. Yeah. <laughs> And we don't we certainly don't want to ever offend anyone, but we're gonna talk about some subjects that might make some people that I'm thinking of specific people in my mind, it might make them uncomfortable. So yeah. I, I want to do this show for some specific people that I have relationships with who who I want to get this message to. So after we make the show, Fred, I'm gonna send this link to people who will maybe not speak to me for the next five years, but then later they'll thank me. I yeah, think. you planting a seed. And, you know, I think a lot of us yeah. might know someone that we think, hey, are the is this, are you putting your kids on this drugs? Do you really think it's cor the correct thing to do? So I do want to have a qualifier before we start this, Doug, and that is, um, you know, drug use. There are drugs that are useful. So oh, we actually, you know, man's innovation and whatnot. So, I, you know, I'm close to somebody who has epilepsy, and the only way to treat it is with a drug. Yes, um, absolutely. And otherwise, this person would have seizures. It's just uh, the way it is. And that drug's been very effective. Um, and so there is medication that's valuable. And, you know, man's ability, God gave us the ability to think and to invent and to help the fallen creation. Because that is what we were living in, a fallen right. creation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, me personally, uh, I'm... I'm on a medication for uh, blood pressure. So I had to go to the ER, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And my it, blood, high blood pressure runs in my family. Yeah. And I had been trying to fight it for years. I knew I had high blood pressure. The first time I had it, I'm like, okay. The doctor says, you have high blood pressure. But I was, in the, I was at the eye doctor. And I'm like, they said I might have a little hole in my eye. And oh. it turns out it was nothing. It was something that healed itself. But I'm like, of course I have high blood pressure. I'm an engineer. I need my eyes. And you're telling me I might have a problem with one of my eyes. Okay. <laughs> so that was the first time I had that high blood pressure. Attention. So I didn't believe it because I'm like, I, I no, normally would, I would have had super high blood pressure, you know, worried about my eye. Well, then later on, I went in uh, with my son who had like uh, some kind of strep throat. And I asked him, asked the nurse, hey, can you give me a blood pressure test just to see? Yeah. And it was high. So then I started monitoring my blood pressure and I did a lot of research and it said, the research said, Number one, lose weight. So it was the very first time I ever went on a real diet. I'd have been on diets before that everybody joked and laughed at me, and they were right. I really wasn't on a diet. I tried to be. <laughs> but that one actually, I actually seriously got on one. I shocked right. my family that I actually stuck to it, and I lost like 20 pounds. And my blood pressure got to be kind of more, a little, not normal, but better. Yeah. But then over time, you know, I as I, as I got older, that wasn't enough. And then eventually I had to go to the AR because I had like 185 over 110. And I made the mistake. I didn't tell him I had a chest pain. So I had to sit in the <laughs> ER room for like three hours. But yeah. anyways, I'm on a medication that controls my blood pressure. And I do think it works. You know, yes, it's, yes. it's doing the trick. So this show isn't about drugs are all bad. The not all no. of them are. But we're going to talk about the ones that we think the audience needs to hear about. That are not, they're not very helpful, and it's, yeah. we need to get this information out there, Doug. Yeah, and this is a topic that a number of listeners have asked about, and they've commented on, and no doubt some people in our audience have experience firsthand. Yeah, and Doug, it all starts with understanding modern psychology, psychology. and you know psychoanalysis, uh -huh. and how the you know how the idea of putting your kid on a prescription drug is somehow going to improve their behavior and make them mentally healthy. Right. Mentally healthy. What about physically healthy? But anyways, we're going to get into all of that. So, Doug, in preparation for the show, you sent me some stuff from Jerry Bergman. We love Dr. Jerry Bergman. He's yeah. got like a 30,000 PhDs. I mean, he's got <laughs> he's a really bright guy. He's got a lot of he's got a lot of uh, knowledge and expertise. We love tapping into his Well, and and let me just say for our friends over at uh creation.com answers in genesis if you want to understand the history of psychology and psychoanalysis as as best i can tell and i spent the better part of two weeks researching there's not a better source for information than jerry bergman's 2010 report it, yep. it, it doesn't exist as far as i can tell it, it really will educate you on the history of all of that 
Yeah, so he talks about Sigmund Freud. Did I say that name right? <laughs> Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud. Yeah, he wrote that the theories of Darwin strongly attracted me, for they held out hopes of extraordinary advance in our understanding of the world. Mm -hmm. As a result, Freud took Darwinian biology as his foundation. So this is a guy that really started the whole psychoanalysis, psychology revolution and made it popular and people just you know the left just worship sigmund freud oh yeah which is a scary proposition he's considered a, a genius giant of the 20th century all of our universities who crank out psychology degrees they're all under the influence of sigmund freud and all of his theories that is the foundation of the training of the modern psychologist and and bergman's article goes on uh, by quoting the clinically recognized methods of psychoanalysis. Listen to this, quote, At the core of psychoanalysis is free association, a technique encouraging the patient to talk about whatever comes to his mind. The goal is to uncover the unconscious roots of human behavior in man's ineradicable animal nature. Yeah. One of the therapist's major roles is to provide an accepting environment that allows the patient to shed animal inhibitions, open up and mentally roam without direction or censorship. Wow. So right right away you see his worldviews coming from humans are really just animals. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bergman goes on to say, so Freud taught that innate biological drives such as sex ultimately determine all behavior. So quote, after Darwin had shaken mankind's self-esteem by proposing a theory demonstrating human kinship with other animals, Freud shattered it still further by asserting that people were far less master in their own mental house than they had always supposed. So, so Freud to the rescue. Yeah. In short, he taught the ego is largely the servant of unconscious and uncontrollable forces of the mind. Right. And so unbelievable. you wonder why the younger generation lacks a, a certain level of certitude that it seems like we had decades ago. The young people today seem to lack a certain solid certainty about anything. And it all goes back to the fact that their parents and their grandparents have subscribed to this sort of worldview that we're animals and that we're under the control of, of just biological chemical reactions. And, and not that there's not some truth to that. There's some truth to that. Th and that's why medication works. Mm -hmm. Because there is some truth to the fact that chemical reactions can govern the health of your body and, and your mind. But the idea that there, this is the controlling factor, it, it blots out the, the option for there to be a spiritual component. And mm -hmm. so we now have two and three generations of Americans unfamiliar with the spiritual option at all. Yeah. And, and Bergman goes on in his article, he quotes the Discovery Institute's wedge document, uh, which, by the way, you should just read that because the, the left hates it. They hate, hate, hate the Discovery Institute. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and read the wedge document. It's, it's worth a read on its own. But uh, Bergman quotes, he says, Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud portrayed humans not as moral spiritual beings, but as animals or machines who inhabited a universe ruled by purely impersonal forces and whose behavior and very thoughts were dictated by the unbending forces of biology, chemistry, and the environment. Yeah, so Doug, it's such, it's a materialist worldview that's being foisted onto us, and now it's just embodied all of psychology. You go to colleges, and that's what you're going to learn if you're getting a degree in psychology. Right, you're going to get this materialistic worldview, which is you're you're going to miss out on the truth. Honestly, sorry, you just you know, real science radio. That's right. Do right or risk the consequences. It's in this area of modern psychology, and you know we're we're drawn to this idea that behavioral problems are all the result of these chemical imbalances. Ah, the old chemical and, imbalance. Yeah, and, so, and, and that we can treat them with prescription drugs. I mean, you know, the public schools right away, they want to treat you. I guarantee you, Doug, 
if my parents had listened to the public schools and if the public schools were like they were back then as they are now, and it's not like they were any good back then, but they're worse now, yeah. I would have been on all kinds of drugs. Trust me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to the, uh, we're going to get to the, the, uh, I, I don't even know what to call it because you can't really call it a diagnosis when it comes to, to this, uh, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. But before we get to that, let's talk about drugs in the Bible. Okay. Does the Bible talk about drugs? The Bible talks about mm -hmm. drugs. And the Bible makes reference specifically to mind-altering drugs, psychoactive drugs. Um, in Galatians chapter 5, Revelations chapter 9, Revelations chapter 18, the Bible equates psychoactive drugs, which are drugs you take to get high, drugs you take to alter your perception of reality, mm -hmm. not medication you take for your blood pressure, not medication that helps with seizure disorders, no. We're talking about drugs you take to get high and distort your and pervert your your psyche. The Bible equates them all with witchcraft and sorcery. Okay? So we can deduce from the context especially in Revelation 18 that these references refer to taking drugs to alter perception, but they're also references to the promotion and use of psychoactive chemicals by merchants. The Bible specifically condemns drug dealers uh, almost by name. It calls them merchants. So according to the Bible, taking drugs to intentionally alter one's perception of reality is condemned and the promotion and sale of such drugs for such purposes is condemned as deceit, specifically in the Bible. Yeah, and Doug, when you sent this to me, I thought it was really interesting. So in Galatians, it's, you know, psycho these psychoactive chemicals, they're listed alongside the sin of, of drunkenness in right? Galatians. And when you when I looked up the verse, there is a footnote that says it refers to the sorcery as uh, drugs. Right. So there's a Greek translation that apparently references, you know, drugs. There's, there is a, it is in there. And then if it's interesting, you know, you think of like Genesis 9, you know, Noah. Right. He, he got drunk and was unable to protect his family. Bob wrote a super interesting article on that and is why was Canaan cursed? Because it's one of the more difficult passages in the Bible if you're not familiar enough with the Bible. Right. Because it's like, oh, so what's this big sin that Ham saw his father naked? I've had right. atheists, you know, like, well, that's silly. Why, why is that such a big deal? Why would Canaan get cursed? Well, go to rsr.org slash Canaan, C-A-N-A-A-N, and read the reason why, because the Bible tells you why. Yeah. What did Ham do? What was his big sin? Yeah, it's in there. Yeah. And it's, it is shocking. And Noah got drunk and was unable to protect his family as he should have, unable to protect his wife yep. from his uh, evil, evil, rotten son, who, by the way, was living before the flood when the whole world was... Yeah, generate exactly to the point where God destroyed everything. So you so, can imagine Noah's sons maybe weren't all the, the they weren't all the straight and narrow that Noah was. No. So know? long story short, Ham slept with his mom, and so then Canaan's produced from that, and so Noah said, "Well, Canaan's going to be cursed because now he's going to have a mother." And his grandmother is the same person. So right. imagine the going to you know public schools after the flood. The, yeah, your the, family's going to be just everybody. Yeah, exactly. Right? You're just you're cursed in that regard. So again, you can read the details on that and why the Bible makes it actually very clear mm -hmm. that that's what happened. Yes, with, and, in that uh, in that situation. Yeah, and God uses a very polite way to describe it, but he gives a he gives very strong. Uh, what would you say, like keys in the Bible to explain what it means to see someone's yeah, nakedness? Yeah, the, the figure of speech to to look upon the nakedness of someone. That figure of speech, when you actually study it out in the Bible, at the end of that you study, get, you're like, how did I miss that? How did, it, I, how did I not know what that meant? Exactly. It's that clear that that's what happened. So then, you know, there's the example in Genesis 19, and that's where Lot gets drunk and he commits and is taken advantage by his wicked daughters. Oh, you know, Lot after that? Sodom. That was, yeah. Right? So, yep. Of all places, Sodom, of course. So these two incidences of drunkenness, they produce these people groups, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. Uh, the Amin Aminobites? <laughs> I think it's Ammonites. Uh, Ammonites, yeah, yes. 
and yeah. the electric lights and the termites and the- that's, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, through the Bible. Uh, J. Vernon McGee used to say the electric lights. <laughs> so but if you think about it, look, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, Moabites, Ammonites, these all were the enemies of Israel and they were the pagans who possessed what God considered the best land on earth was possessed and corrupted by these wicked, evil people. They became so wicked that God told Israel, when you go in there, kill all of them. Destroy them completely. So that's how wicked they became. And and when you read the story of the Bible, because Israel failed to follow God's advice and utterly destroy these wicked tribes, they become a source of suffering and and torment for Israel throughout the whole Bible, for the rest of the whole story, even up to today, even in the Middle East right Mm -hmm. now. Why is there problems? It all goes back to Noah and Lot getting drunk. It it all, the the problems can all be traced back there. And, And the generational curse, Fred, the amount of bloodshed, warfare, suffering, sin, and the eternal condemnation of souls related to those two incidents of drunkenness, I mean, it's almost beyond measure just from two incidents of two guys. And, you know, it'll be interesting on Judgment Day to see just how many of the wars and the famines and all these other sources of human suffering were directly related to drunkenness, whether by alcohol or by drugs. On Judgment Day, if we want to, God's running videotape on everything. He'll be able to show us everything that happens. And I would bet you that almost every war was in large part either started or extended due to drunkenness. And a guarantee warfare is sustained by drunkenness. That's how warfare is sustained. You have to be out of your mind to want to kill your fellow man. You have to literally lose your mind in order to do that. Yeah. And that's what war is. And so here's what's really interesting that we're going to be bringing up about a particular drug that's in heavy use today, yeah. Doug. It's the most consumed drug in the world today. You'd mentioned World War II. Mm-hmm. So it, it helped make World War II the most destructive event in human history. It's it's the one, it's given by prescription to all the all the kids in the world as a medicine. Yeah. And you know, for for things like here it is, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Mm-hmm. And so, Doug, we're talking about amphetamines. Amphetamines. And there's a lot of history about amphetamines that people don't know about. Yeah. And you're going to find out about it. You're going to find out about it here today. We're going to talk uh, we're going to talk about World War II. We're going to talk about the sexual revolution, right? World War II essentially shaped the 20th century. World War II. It was the seminal event of the 20th century. And the sexual revolution Although that came toward the end of the 20th century, it seems to be the seminal event shaping the 21st century, right? Mm -hmm. As we watch people speaking of losing your mind, right? So let's start with World War II and let's start with the fact that Adolf Hitler was on amphetamines. Yep. So, and if you doubt me, it's, it's, it's well documented by his own doctor and it's documented in books. He fueled his industry, he fueled his army with millions and millions of amphetamine pills a week at the height of his power. And it's all documented in among in one of, I'll quote a book called Blitzed, Drugs in the Third Reich by Norman Oler. But that's just one of the sources. There are countless sources. Adolf Hitler was on speed. He was on amphetamines. He was on the same drug that your doctor is prescribing to your teenage son. Yep. Wow. And you know, Doug, our producer, when we were talking about this show, he mentioned seeing this uh, video of this concentration camp where they're throwing Jews that are still alive into a trench. And they're all going to die there. And they're smoking cigarettes and laughing and joking. They're not necessarily looking down here. They're just they're just sitting there with their cigarettes and chuckling and, you know, talking as to each other. As casual as any yeah, other yeah, event. Exactly. Right? Yes. Exactly. And so, Doug, as it turns out, by the end of the war, even the Allies were on amphetamines. Uh, yeah. So they've got declassified purchase orders for hundreds of thousands of pills at the time 
showed, showed it showed that the Allies invested in Benzedrine. Mm-hmm. Right. And as much as the Axis, they were investing in their version called Pervitin. Uh-huh. So, and the war effort on both sides, on, on the civilian front as well as the battlefront, it was it was fueled in large part through the rap, the, really through just the administration of these mind altering drugs. It's right. amazing. Yeah, and and so the purchase orders exist from the U.S. Department of Defense, the Army. You can you can see these things. So we were fueling our army with amphetamines. Hitler was fueling his army with amphetamines. Stalin was fueling his army with vodka and amphetamines, hmm. right? The whole war, right? And so now, now here in America, so think about that. So just let that settle in your mind. World War II, the most destructive event in human history, fueled by amphetamines. And now millions of kids have been raised on amphetamines since yep. the 1990s. There's been a steady stream of five or 10 million prescriptions or more every year for amphetamines in America. Who's taking all these amphetamines? Well, these prescriptions have skyrocketed along with millions of children being diagnosed with this or that psychological disorder and treated in accordance with the psychology of Sigmund Freud, a psychology that taught doctors that behavior problems were essentially chemical imbalances in the brains of evolved animals that we used to call our children and who we used to view as children of God entrusted to us temporarily. That's the way I was Mm -hmm. brought up. That's the way my mom and dad were brought up, that your children are given to you by God temporarily and you are responsible. And that's an eternally significant responsibility that God has handed you. And that's all been decimated by psychoanalysis, psycho uh, psychology, Sigmund Freud, and now the, the, the drugs. Yeah, it's a great point, Doug. So God entrusted us with the care of our children. And we're using, so many of us are using the backdrop of just think about it, you're using Darwin, mm. you know, Mark, Karl Marx, and Sigmund Freud. Their worldview is based on materialism without God, and we're using their advice on how to raise kids. Right. That's, I mean, that's a tragedy. It really is. And you consider the effect that we've seen with that. Um, I don't know. You know, Doug, I play in a kind of a just for fun band. I was in a classic rock band for right, back, right. In my, back in the day. And, yeah, if you Google um, Fred Williams, by the way, you'll see <laughs> some of the pictures from the 80s, I think. Ooh, or right. the, or okay, the, yeah, that's kind of scary, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh, they're there. <laughs> they're they there. never go away, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually had a really good band, but, you know, you th- I think it's some of the, you know, the artists that were uh, part of that 80s, 70s, 80s classic rock, you know, the, the Grateful Dead. How do people right. like the Grateful Dead? I don't get that, but I think in order to like them, you probably have to be on amphetamines or smoking pot. Oh yeah, so you that's have just to me. Be on me. Drugs. And I hate to say it, you know, every a lot of people like the Rolling Stones. I hate the Rolling Stones. I don't know how that guy ever got famous because he's not that good a singer. D- well, and, why do you think people suspect that someone had to have made a deal oh, with the devil? Yeah, <laughs> because there's no way Mick Jagger could have ever become famous. Uh, unbelievable. Unless he actually signed his soul over. There's no way the guy's. Well, you think of like Kurt Cobain, Eminem, Kid Rock. I mean, me personally too, Bob Dylan. How is that guy considered a singer? Well, you know, and then the rap music that they have today, and it's so so bad. I mean, almost anybody can sing rap, and then their filthy lyrics. So it's, I don't know. Music careers that really probably would have never taken off, Doug, if it wasn't <laughs> for drugs, both by the musicians, by the people listening to them. Yes. Again, I, uh, you know, I marvel. I talk to a lot of musicians, you know, like, like people in my band and stuff. How do people like the Grateful Dead? I mean, there's people really like them. Oh, yeah. But you wonder. And I actually know somebody who likes the Grateful Dead who doesn't smoke pot. No so way. That's weird. Yeah. And I'll, well, I'll never there's quite an understand. Exception there's always exceptions. <laughs> So, anyways, Doug, you know, no, you that's have, the kind of... You lo- have to have something dulling or t- perverting your <laughs> perception of reality in order to appreciate the Grateful Dead. That whole list, there's probably a much longer list. Let me see if there's anyone you left off that I yeah. want. Oh, Neil Young. <laughs> yes. How could you leave Neil Young off that list? He's in the very top. Yeah, no, list. I agree. I yes, agree. Yes, yes. And that's just kind of, that's the lighter side of... 
uh, the, the bad results. But it, there, there's a much. We'll much... probably get a few letters in the side of criticism from our audience, but that's okay. You know, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that, <laughs> please. There's wait, no wait. lack for bad taste in music, but you know. Yes, and and by the way, <laughs> uh, we could start a list, and you could start contributing. We could have the list of artists who never would have made it without drugs, <laughs> and that list will. Get... Bob is always big on list shows. We, right. we, 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 we have that we a whole new list, new list, right? <laughs> anyway, that's that's kind of the funny light side. Although anyway, it has its its significant uh, detrimental uh, contributions to civilization. But there's an even darker side, much darker. Now we are now sixty years in the wake of the sexual revolution, the so-called sexual revolution, right? Which, by the way, it's another war of sorts fueled by drugs. And we're now experiencing this exponential increase in suicides and homicides mm -hmm. among kids, right? Murder and suicide among kids, right? Those, like, murder and suicide are two things that I would have just never thought to associate with kids. Mm -hmm. That never crossed mm -hmm. my mind, right? And now, that's an everyday occurrence. There's some teenager either killing himself or killing other people every day it's happening every day yeah it's and a huge epidemic you huge. know it really is and so i'm not a i'm not a, a scientist but i can't help but assume that there's some significant connection between the murder and suicide now commonly associated with kids and the amphetamines that all the kids are on all the psychoactive the psychotropic drugs the ssris all of these drugs for depression and anxiety mm -hmm. and ADHD. I just can't help but suspect that that's all connected. Well, so let's talk about ADHD. And I know that, the, you know, this is the part where there, there'll be people offended in the audience, but you know, that's, that's, uh, we speak the truth here. Yes. Yes. We want to get this information. Yeah, and by out, the way, so. it, it was ADD first. Oh, that's right. It was ADD. Yeah. Yep. Right. Attention so deficit disorder. I have an old axiom. When they start, when they change the name of stuff, you got to start suspecting. Like when global warming became climate change. Huh? Good point. What? What's yeah. going on there? Something's yeah. going on. Somebody's moving shells around. Yeah. And I don't like that. So ADD was attention deficit disorder. And that was all the rage from, I don't know, 1980 to 1990-ish. Mm -hmm. And then it became ADHD, right? And it wasn't a high definition. I forget what it was about. It was, it added <laughs> attention deficit, it. high definition disorder. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, so drugs like, you know, we, we've all heard of Ritalin and Adderall. Guess what? These are amphetamines. They're amphetamines. Yep. Yes, they are. So mm -hmm. it's what the drug dealer used to call speed. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You know? That's right. Back when there was some shame about it, right? Yeah. Back when it was illegal. So, you know, I would hope, Doug, that most in the audience haven't had their child, you know, diagnosed with ADHD. I hope. Again, I think because I was kind of hyperactive, uh, you know, I had a very, you know, I was a very active child. I have a feeling that if I didn't have good parents, I would have been put on ADD yeah. or ADHD, these yeah. drugs, you know, these drugs to solve my problem and really just to kind of dumb me down and quiet me up, uh -huh. basically, is what yes, it would do. Yes, yes, so. absolutely. So I had a conversation with a, a friend who's on these drugs, and she said, well, Doug, you don't understand. If you, if you need Adderall, when you take it, it makes you sleepy. And I said, I don't believe you. I don't believe you in any mm -hmm. way, not even a little bit. Nobody gets sleepy taking amphetamines. Well, if you have the chemical ba imbalance. And anyway, this person has been on some sort of anxiety medication since she was in her 20s, since she was diagnosed as anorexic. And so by now, I'm assuming she probably has some significant chemical imbalance and, and it could very well be that that there's been enough chemical, physical destruction in her brain that she might actually need drugs just to be normal. And that's mm. pretty sad when you get to that that level. But yep. um, no child takes amphetamines and gets sleepy, and then that's how you know that they needed that. No, I don't yeah. believe you, Mom. I don't believe you. So yeah. I tried to find out about where does ADHD come from? Like you ask the question, what's ADHD? Okay, well, it's not like asking what is acne. Well, no, it is like acting, asking what is acne. But with acne, there's an answer. 
<laughs> acne is an infection related to the pea acne bacteria and the fact that teenagers don't wash their face enough and they get pimples, right? Well, with ADHD, it's not nearly that cut and dry to figure out what is it. Yep. Because, and so I, I, I researched the earliest study I can find that's referred to by those who publish on ADHD came out in 1999. The British Child and Adolescent Mental Health Survey, 1999. The prevalence of, and I don't want to use too many bureaucratic acronyms, but the DSM-4 disorders. And, and so when you start looking into, and you can't tell me the bacteria and you can't tell me the diagnosis instead it's a dsm-4 disorder I i'm automatically suspicious like what are you trying to tell me about my child that mm -hmm. that so anyway uh, this 1990 1999 paper was about a study involving uh, a little over ten thousand children they were assessed using the development and well-being assessment a structured interview and verbatim reports uh a structured interview with verbatim reports reviewed by clinicians so that information from parents and teachers and children was combined in a manner that emulated the clinical process. Yep. Emulated. And I notice here that it says that roughly one in 10 children have at least one of these disorder, Doug. Uh -huh. One in 10. That's more than the number, the percentage of homos. Yes. Yeah. You know, so at least yeah. it was. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, because they always said homos were ten percent, but it was actually more like one percent. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But so, do you really think there's that many out there that have a disorder? I mean, that's yeah, just nonsense. No. No. Anyway, so what is the DSM four disorder, doctor? Well, you're not supposed to a ask, mom. You're just supposed to do what I tell you. I'm going to write you a prescription. The the DSM four, by the way, is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the fourth edition. It's the book that Sigmund Freud's psychology produced for the modern psychologist to analyze your teenager and, and figure out what disorders he has. And these disorders involve levels of distress or social impairment. This manual, the DSM, is the manual that's designed to find a disorder in your child. That's what the DSM is designed to do. It's designed to find uh, ADHD. And how do we know this? Because the study itself said they reported that the ADHD diagnosis may be missed if information sought from teachers about children's functioning in school is left out. So if you just interview the kid and you just interview mom and dad, you might not figure out that he needs to be drugged. You need to talk to his teacher too. Wow. And then, because why? The teacher's been conditioned to accept psychology. What do most teachers have a degree, at least a minor in psychology, right? The, the entire educational establishment has been brainwashed into this psychological view of the child so naturally, the drug dealers who want to drug your kids, they want the input from the people who they've trained to do what they're doing. And I'm not like a, I'm not saying this is like a big dark conspiracy, but mm -hmm. I mean a conspiracy is one or more people <laughs> yeah. acting together <laughs> to produce a specific end. And yeah. I'm telling you that the educational system is in place to separate you from your child, to separate your yep. child from God and to take money out of your pocket. And we'll get to some more of that too. Yeah, so um, yeah, with such a great point. You know, Doug, the public schools, like you said, they're, they're based on humanism, materialism, they're teaching evolution. And the fact that you have to rely on one of the teachers from the public schools instead of your own common sense about your child. Mm -hmm. You know, this reminds me, and I'm dovetailing a little bit here, but we had these uh, people we knew when Ryan was younger and their kid was diagnosed with Asperger's. Asperger's, If you, yeah. if you remember that, in fact, while you were talking, I looked that up on the uh, Google here. Google was my friend here. Asperger's syndrome, a form of autism spectrum disorder, is a developmental disorder. Young people with Asperger's syndrome have a difficult time relating to others socially and their behavior and thinking patterns can be rigid and repetitive. Okay, their son, was he just wasn't real outgoing. That's all it was. 
Well, guess what? They decided that he had Asperger's, and I guarantee I haven't studied Asperger, whoever this character was, but I guarantee you he's a materialist who has a background. Uh, he, uh, his bedrock is evolution. Yes. I, I, I'm predicting that. That's an RSR prediction. I have not looked this up because we, you know, I just thought to look at this up thinking about this child. And he, this kid, when he found, when his parents were giving him medication, he then had it justified in his mind that he could act weird. Because it was, a, you know, he can't help it. So he needs to be on drugs to keep from acting weird. We had a, a psychologist, an expert in psychology, come to Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship once. And I, his talk was fantastic. One of the things I remember that I took away from that was that a people who have a problem like an addiction with, like, say, alcoholism. He said that, you know, the, the biggest problem with some of the people he worked with was they, they thought it was some kind of disease instead of realizing they just liked being drunk. They were happy about being drunk and it just yeah. admit the problem. Yeah. And so I'm and, a sinner and I like that particular sin. Yeah. I've been sinning that way regularly. And, yeah. Yeah. That's unless, what it is. unless you, but he was this, these people are taught that, well, they can't help it. And so they need oh, drugs right. or whatever. And so an ex, another example is my younger brother. You know, I love my brother, but. I remember he called me once and he said, you know, my sister thinks I should go on, you know, Redlin and stuff like that because I got a, you know, I'm bipolar. And I go, Larry, I love you. You're my brother, but I'm going to tell you what your problem is. And just remember, I love you. It's my brother. You're a bum. You, you don't, <laughs> yeah. you'd like to play video games and, and you don't have a job and Ouch. except, yeah. And I'm like, I, the reason I'm telling you this is I, you know, if you're told that you have a problem chemically, then you're not going to fix it. You're going to rely on Ritalin and you're still mm. just going to be a bum. And guess what happened? He ended up getting a job, I don't know, three or four months later. Praise the Lord. And, and then four or five months later after that, I remember my mom saying, you know, Larry's not so moody anymore. And I was like, yeah, guess what? He got a job. <laughs> and that's what that, and, and Larry was so thankful he didn't go on those drugs because he got tricked in the meeting with a psychologist to put him on this, uh, whatever the bipolar medicine was. Yeah, yeah. That wasn't the problem. The problem was he liked playing video games. At the time, I didn't know this, and he admits this now. He was a pot smoker, yeah. and now he's he's really anti pot. He's been out of uh, he he went to double uh, at double A Alcoholics Anonymous. He he's a big proponent of that now, just because it really helped him. He's been he hasn't had a alcohol in like ten years. So he fantastic story. But anyways, I just wanted to mention that Doug, as you're going through this, because people get tricked into thinking that this stuff helps and all it does is give them an excuse yeah yeah an excuse to keep doing what they were doing well and, and maybe you can answer this fred how is add diagnosed adhd i'm sorry how is it diagnosed well guess what we're gonna have to answer that on the next show because oh. we're out of time okay and doug it just occurred to me we were out of time on the last show and we forgot to talk about brain dead isn't always dead oh that's right. <laughs> should we push that teaser on to we'll, the next we'll show that. we'll do that next time we'll do that next time so we, pro we have a really interesting story about uh, someone that they thought was dead and wasn't so we'll get to that and so much more we're going to finish up this show on this adhd and all these drugs and boy mm -hmm. doug such useful information you know world war ii and not just the evil Nazis, but the right. allies were on amphetamines. A lot of ah. people don't know that. Yeah. So for Doug McBurney, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.